So, Chisaya, thank you very much for being on the show. We're looking forward to exploring a little bit about your journey, what you've been up to. Because if we look you up, you look like you do lots of things. So I want to unpack some of those things (laughs) um, and kind of explore where where you're going with it. What's the vision? What's the direction? And how we might be able to engage with you. So before we begin, could you introduce yourself? Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Yeah. Um, So my name is Josiah Hyacinth. Um, I am, I'd say I'm a storyteller. Storyteller. Um, I think I use that title because it encompasses a very specific lifestyle. Um, everything I do is project-based um, and any way that I can tell a story is how I do. So my day-to-day is um, I'm a kind of editorial commercial photographer. Mm. Um, I run a few businesses or let's say projects. Mm. Um, and uh, I uh, I go anywhere that I feel led in my heart to mm. go. Um, and I'm, I'm really strong in my faith as well. So that 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 kind of like intersects everything I do. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm a storyteller. Anywhere that I can do story, writing, taking photos, mm. documenting, directing, mm. uh, consulting, okay. uh, mentoring, which is really, really big passion for me. Mm. Um, anywhere that I can tell a story, be a part of a story or ignite a story is, uh, is, is what beautiful. I do. Yeah. Okay. And what's your why? Yeah. Um, what's my why? That's a good question. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I'd say it's cheesy, but like, why not? Um, <laughs> yeah. No, my why. Um, I think my why for me is. Um, I think. I think. I've had a unique journey growing up, um, and I've I've been in every sense a nomad. Uh, but along the way, I've discovered that the impact of a few people who just pay a little bit of attention to you mm. changes your whole life. Um, and I'm I'm a I'm a product of people who just spent five minutes to listen to me. Wow. Um, so my why is because of that, that if I can just find a way to live a life in which I can actually spend five minutes with somebody, like it's incredible to 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 realize that some of the some of the difficulties that people feel in their life mm. comes directly because they've never had anybody actually pay attention to them. Mm. Just genuinely care about what they care about. Mm. So my why is to hopefully like create a world or at least influence a world in which people actually feel seen when they're looked at. Mm. Um so that drives me for everything I do. Um, it's it's creating a detailed um, expression, language, communication in which people can truly feel belonging. That's mm. my why. Mm. Um, so that informs everything else I do and the rest of it is just expression. Mm. Mm. So that's my why. It's very proverbial, isn't it? It's yeah. prover- proverbial, but it's it's quite inspiring because a lot. I feel like a lot of people do a lot of things and those things are always often self self centered. It's about how I can benefit. Yeah. It's how I can gain. But when the why is beyond yourself, it's it's quite a beautiful thing. It's beyond what you want, what you desire, yeah. what how life may benefit you. Um, my question there then is, what is the expression of that? How, what does that look like on a day to day? What what is the caliber of person, people, clientele, perhaps that you get to feed into and pay attention to? Yeah, I think I think that's the unique thing about me is I never really know. Mm. Um, I think life is a big adventure for me. Mm. Um, so I guess to put succinctly, like I can tell you of two rooms I've been in, which really impacted me. Mm. Um, I was, so to, the first room was, I was, I last year, um, two years ago, mm. I would have been consulting with the G7 youth, uh, youth, summit right and i would have ended up speaking to like the princess of wow. of a country in europe that's one room i've been in mm. but then a lot of the rooms i'm actually in a lot of the time the one that really impacted me was i was just in the primary school in secondary school in coventry mm. um just invited to speak and there was a young kid who really wanted to be a stylist a young black kid right young male black kid mm. wanted to be a stylist i've never encountered that before mm. and i was able to just listen to him and connect him with a few people um, that I feel like could help him really mm. chase that passion. Mm. Those are two rooms I'm in. And so my life looks like speaking in a very local secondary school one day and the next it could be in a room with somebody I I literally could never imagine that I'd be with mm. for no apparent reason to, mm. my, to my mind. Um, so every day is an adventure and I get to like, 
witness my life happen. And I think it's down to one thing, which is um, all I do every day is share what I care about. And I believe that increases the, that in increases the, uh, the amount of land of opportunity that you get, mm. the real estate. Mm. So the more you do that is honest to you in the world of today, you increase the real estate of opportunities that can come to mm. you. It's all I ever do while telling stories that I care about and talking to people that I actually care about, whether mm. it's somebody in the shop or I end up in a random room. Mm. They both exist because I speak to somebody on the street. Yeah, I speak to somebody out there. Um, so what I do is speak. So, so I never know. So, so the day-to-day -day looks really random. Mm. Um, and some days I'm just a photographer. Some days I'm a YouTuber that has a lot of followers. Mm. Um, some days I feel like a nobody. Some mm. days I realize I'm somebody. Mm. Um, but I think uh, it's it's it. What persists for me is just making sure that I, that it's that I am who I am, regardless. So um, the mm. platform doesn't take away from me nor add to me. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I struggle to not be intense. By the way, so I'm just gonna give you a heads up. I can do intense. Yeah, I can do. I don't like surface level conversations. Yeah. So I don't so, like small talk. So it's good. Yeah. So I think that, that yeah, that, that's what the day to day looks like. It's hard to describe. Okay. But yeah, a lot of the time I spend I spend a lot of time alone reflecting, writing, doing a lot of editing, podcasting. You know, the day to day is talking to to my team. Okay. Um, trying to make stuff happen. Like it, it looks so different every day. Mm. Um, and and it's because I'm in transition. Right. right. I came out of university self-employed right. um and so that meant i've just been having to figure out what i want to do in the world and how also i, f I believe the world right now is changing yeah. so quickly to what i want to do so it's figuring out how to build a structure of something that seems very personal okay if that makes sense like okay. how do you scale make an impact mm. because you really care um and yeah you just that takes time figuring out of maybe course. the best way to do it of course. Well, could you take us on that journey then? I know you've just mentioned university coming out self-employed, but how, how did you get to that point in time from yeah. maybe thinking secondary school onwards and maybe the influences that might have shaped your decision making along the way? Yeah. I mean, so I've been doing athletics for my whole life. So I've been That's a sprinter. It. And so to define my character well, first, look at the things that I did. I just did high level sports at national level okay that meant i had to do a lot i had to do a lot of sacrificing like really early which meant that like i would miss lunchtime sometimes i'm training three times four times three times a day sometimes four times a week mm. um so that defined my whole structure of life is that life without commitment is meaningless right so i was always just committed to something mm. and thus that made me really intense that made me have to think about my decisions and then you have a coach who you know you we, if I had a girlfriend, I have to talk to the coach about having a girlfriend. Mm. So there was always a consequence for my action. It right. literally affected my performance on the weekend. Right. So when you think so much about life so young, you you think about everything and, and hopefully you begin to create some co sort of code of conduct. Yeah. So you, you create strong values that you don't compromise and mm. essentially you get to know who you are and your person is. Mm. Because one thing about sports as well is that you fail a lot and there's no better teacher <laughs> for experience or for, for like life than, than failure. Mm. So I encountered a lot of failure really early. So I became okay with failure. Right. That then created an expression in which I wasn't afraid to try anything. Um, but tangibly what happened is when I went to university, right, I realized that there was, I didn't have the best coaches and I had, I had a really passionate coach, but he was very stubborn. Right. He was one of the best guys. He invested so much in me, but he was stubborn in, in information. But I realized right. that there was an information gap. And for some reason, um, I wanted to, uh, for some reason, I wanted to kind of like, um, like bridge that gap okay. in some way. And in that, I then decided to, I don't know why, I, I, I honestly couldn't tell you, pick up a camera. Okay. And it was just like random. And then I then created this platform called Young Athlete TV. Okay. Um, and I did this in partnership with um, someone else because we both had the same vision. We're like, bro, we're trying to do this. And he was trying to do that with football. Right. So in university, we like came together, did it. And we started to document um, and like create documentaries. This is the first time I would use a camera. Okay. But this is the first time I'd find out that I really cared about stories. Mm. I think, let's say about four months before that. So I would have came into university in September. So maybe four, yeah, four months, the summer, the summer right. that year. I bought a camera randomly because I wanted to start a blog. And I found that I like taking pictures. Mm. And the first pictures I ever took were really good pictures. And I mm. thought, wow, the 
the composition of this. It just felt very innate. Mm. But I don't know where that came from. Um, so yeah, so when I started, I picked up a camera. And then from there, I started YouTube because I wanted to grow a platform for the documentaries when they came right. out. And then I accidentally stumbled on this audience of people who just really cared about what I was doing. And because I was so okay with failure, I was just, I was just recording stuff mm. and walking around Leicester. I remember my first video, just walking around doing stuff. And that then became what we call vlogging, lifestyle vlogging, right? right. Um, and I noticed that there was no guys doing it. So while I was waiting for this audience to grow and it was growing really quickly, I was still making documentaries. And as my voice increased and my, I guess, influence in Leicester increased, people knew me and I was very like friendly. I was, I was really open. I think I was very not British because like, the British thing is kind of like, you just kind of sit back and don't 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 kind of like affect anyone. Like be silent. I think that's a South England thing. Not <laughs> yeah, it's like a South. Yeah, like North, <laughs> exactly. Like I, I moved to the North because I'm like, this feels like Canada. Like I yeah. love Canada because Canada is like a little bit kind of conservative. It's kind okay. of still, but also it's like super friendly people. Um, and so yeah, like in university, I was just like the really outward guy, and that's from being from Nigeria. We just right. take every opportunity as it comes, and you do that, and then you. You, you do that, it means that you're prepared for if a platform appears. So what happened is my I got I grew a lot of following. I got right. I grew like 30,000 followers in like three, four months, wow. which was so incredible. Um, but whilst I did that, even though I was with my other YouTuber peers, because a bunch of YouTubers came from Leicester at the same time. Okay. Like a bunch. Like okay. that was where the whole influencer burst came from. Right. It came in our year. Not London. No, I mean, a lot of the Londoners will come to Leicester. Right, but, okay. but there were other people, like the Patricia Brights were always there. Yeah, yeah. But there was like an explosion of creatives in, in Leicester because there was just an ecosystem of people in uni. So we could create content accidentally because uh, we were just local. Yeah. The thing about London is everyone's far. So when you have a city like Leicester, it, it's an ecosystem of people close to each other. Mm. So you put that um, with a lot of talent and a lot of inquisition. Um, like for people like me, you just thrive. Mm. So there's a bunch of creatives that just grew in that economy. And for me because I was doing the photography stuff and I needed money tangibly. I had a very, very painful university experience right. where I was getting kicked out. And so I had to find a way to pay for my fees because right. they considered me an international student. So you take that, I was sharing it on my on my YouTube. I was trying to figure out how to tangibly get cash. So I started a photography business. Right. And I didn't do nothing much more than just shoot a few photos in a club. So my journey of entrepreneurship started from desperation. Mm. I was a response entrepreneur. I didn't have a great idea. Mm. I was just like problem solver. Mm. So I'm a I'm a creative that's a problem solver, not like abstract. Mm. I just see problems and I'm like, we can solve that. Mm. And that's what fuels my creativity. So yeah, I did that journey and ended up uh, realizing that Leicester had 10 parties a week, like on average, and there was no photographers. Right. So while I was in the club one day, they were like, and this happened in, in the moments, thought a guy was like, bro, we need photographers. We need some photographers. I was like, I'm, I had like a, that's a raven moment. <laughs> I was like, wait, no photographers. There's li I have this yeah. like, yeah. I was like, yeah, I'm a photographer, <laughs> and that's it. And I mean, at this point, were you a photographer? I wasn't. Like, okay. I, I had literally not even shot the documentary. This is before the documentary. Right, this is right. when I was planning the documentary stuff. Right, right. Um, this is when I just knew that oh, we could loan cameras from university. So I mm. found because of my desire to kind of make documentaries, I found out that we could loan cameras. Mm. I had that one camera I bought, but it was like a Nikon. It was rubbish. Mm. It was so bad. But I knew that I could get like Canon 700Ds and mm. 70Ds, which are like big cameras back in the day back compared then, to yeah, now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and they're only shooting 1080p, no 4K. <laughs> so like, I ended up, I just, in that moment, I just connected dots. And I was like, wait, if I charge a hundred pounds minimum an mm. event, I could do, I could make a thousand pounds a week. And that's what I did. Mm. And I just start, that's how I started hustling and um, it just grew this analytical mind. Mm. So by the time I left university, I was so, uh, my 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 reflex was to just think through life so achievably, um, and in that first year, I made a strategy. I said, if I want to, if you want to make a million pounds, you have to speak to a million people and ask them for one pound. Mm. Which meant for me, I had to become the most valuable person on campus, and so I spoke to every single person, wow. and I gave everybody my heart fully. Mm. Which meant that if there is ever a day, and what what, what was crazy is that in that year, I needed nine thousand mm. pounds, and one day, a friend of mine whilst I'm trying to figure out how I get out of the hole I was in, um, made a GoFundMe for me. Wow. And there was about 8,000 pounds raised in about a week and a half. Wow. That that would then go to change my platform. That would grow the, the platform. It would then give me a sense of purpose that I didn't mm. think was there before. Um, 
And then from there, that's that's where the whole Mr. 200 brand would come from. And, mm. and then from there, it would go from making this documentary to, bro, you are changing the lives of many international students in this country. Mm. And I was literally fighting just to have an education. Mm. Um, from the point where I'm going to the vice chancellor's office, having a meeting with him, he offers me three scholarships on the spot. What? And time to get them done. He can't give them to me. Mm. Um, so I'm mean, like, hope, failure, hope, failure. The GoFundMe money comes, but 2000 goes on tax or something. And 2000 gets refunded to people. I had just enough. And because of the friendship I built with the vice chancellor, he pardoned my fees. Wow. So he gave me a discount. Um, so I had just enough money with like 300 pounds spare to pay, pay the rent for that month. And that's what got me in a place where I, I could leave university without debt. Wow. And then I'd then I'd go again at it and then I'd reapply mm. to go to the same university, which was crazy. But it's because I believed I was meant to be there. Wow. Really sure. Was that for like a master's or first degree. Just to, okay. This is when I was uh So this was just to get through an academic year. First academic year ever. I thought this was you were talking about trying to pay for the whole degree. Just the just the nine thousand. Just the first, just to get Lord past the first. But for me it was thirteen five hundred. So okay. I had to first God. I had to first win the case because I've, I've been in the country half my life. So I was actually legally a home student. Mm. Um, but they didn't, no, no university wanted to give me home student status. Right. So I had to fight a whole case whilst being in uni. Eventually, because I then, you know, reached out to the vice chancellor and everything, I, I eventually won the case. And I guess it's on the side note, this is why it's so important to share stories is mm. because whilst I was doing that, that uncovered thousands of students going through the same thing. Right. And what was able to happen, which I saw happen was my vice chancellor was so, he was so personally invested in that journey mm -hmm. that I then started to see these outbursts of like um, night vigils. Wow. Made for international students at the time. Wow. Um, and this, this, this allowed my case to go so viral that student finance actually verified me the next year. Wow. Through Twitter, through a DM. Goodness. Um, that's the power of social media. Yeah. Um, and... We got to change thousands of people's lives. We also got to do an investigation into student finance mm. to find out that there was a number that doesn't match up that had to do with international students. Right. It wasn't making sense why many people weren't being allowed, like allowed to, to get status when they have the evidence and documents to show that they've been here for more mm. than half their life. Mm. So it wasn't my story that got changed in that moment. It was actually multiple people, like thousands of people. Um, and that's mm. been like a, it's something that still catches up with me sometimes. Yeah, like I met yeah. someone who just finished university randomly. I was at my friend's birthday, like, you know, like a year and a half ago. And she was like, hey, thank you. I was like, what do you mean thank you for? She's like, you know, if, if you never replied to my DM that day, I would have never gone to university Imagine. and I would have never got my degree. And I said, what do you mean? She was like, I asked you, oh, should I go, should I take the risk? Cause I have this situation and you, you didn't just give me advice, but you actually gave me the contact that you used to win the case. Um, and she won the case. Wow. She got some finance and she, she got through her university degree. So wow. I was like, you know, I, 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 that was amazing. I guess mm. that goes back to that why. Yeah. That's why, man. You know, you, wow. don't, you don't get to get moments like that. Yeah, yeah. Unless you put yourself out there. Yeah. I think that those are really beautiful moments and reminders to keep doing what you've committed to do. And that it's not always that everyone gets to see the direct impact of their work. Yeah. So to be able to get just a glimpse of the impact you've made in people's lives is really inspiring, very encouraging. Yeah, yeah. Wow. You're doing the same thing. See, I, I feel like I don't always get to see the impact. Being in the classroom, yeah. you get to see the direct impact because you know yeah. your, your your occupation is very relational and you have long-term relationships, but- yeah. But you'll never, when, see the big, you'll never see the biggest part. Yeah. But yeah, you have to know it's happening. I, that's it. I, I do believe yeah. it's happening. You get that feedback every so often when someone says, I saw this, I heard this, this encouraged. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I guess uh, kind of thinking around all that, what has been your, I know you said you're, you're a person of faith, but what has been your mental health and well-being journey along the way in, t in terms of navigating those challenges and then still choosing to move forward, solve problems and, and kind of respond to what you're seeing? in your world, in your vicinity? Um, yeah, I mean, I wish I could give you something outside of the faith. I think okay. I think that's the point of faith is it transcends your understanding in the sense that it doesn't make sense for me to keep going. It doesn't, like through all the difficult moments I've had, it doesn't make sense why I would give maybe people, maybe try again. 
but that's where faith steps in. Faith is the other side of things that I just can't do. Yeah. And in that moment that you admit that you can't do it, you begin to see that you can do it mm. um, or it can be done. Mm. And so for me, I guess uh, mentally, the mental health journey has been crazy. You know, like uh, it's been a very, very, I've, sometimes I think I have the gift of suffering, which is a very interesting phrase to say. Mm. But I genuinely believe that I think I go through experiences because I have stories to tell. Mm. So the danger of being a storyteller is you have to tell a story, yeah. which means you have to live one. Yeah. And I feel like through faith, I get to, uh, I get to journey through my own story mm. and in some way get a sense of control, even though I don't have full control. And I get to share that story mm. in, in these little kind of bite-sized um, moments that make things okay. So I think that's one motivation mentally, like when things are really dark and I've been through kind of every kind of real deep sense of isolation and mm. um, really tough things. You know, there was a, to be very transparent, there was, there was one, I went through what would be like, kind of like a psychosis. Right. I don't know what year this was, um, but it, my mental health got so bad that I would like tie my hands behind my back mm. um, because I would be nervous of what I could do to myself. Now I didn't self harm particularly in the way we know it to be. Mm. But sometimes I might just get angry and punch something mm. or I was so deeply frustrated at life and I couldn't, I couldn't um, express what that was. You know, I, I really was suffering with being able to express things, but I noticed that that paired for me, I just had to journey. And I think with mental health, you just simply have to journey through things because why faith for me helps me is because if I don't have faith, when I see end, that's the end. Mm. But if I have faith when I see end, then the beginning is hot at its heels. Yeah. And that's that's that in a sense is the only thing that's hope is the only place you can find that. Mm. It's hard to find that anywhere else. Mm. Um mm. because nothing makes sense. And mm. when nothing makes sense, like it doesn't make sense. So why continue? Um I guess for me, I, I continue because there's like this whole adventure and I can't take myself out of the game. Mm. Um it's just not worth it. Because there has to be more. And if if there's galaxies out there that exist, then there has to be galaxies in me that exist, which means I can't ever really discover the full depths of myself and I have to be okay with, with my absolute limitedness. Mm. I think if you can come into peace with how limited you are, then you see, you see mental health less as a, as a season that you have to get out of, but more so as just like, that's life. Mm. And then from there, you can start to have joy because mm. the danger of seasons is Okay, it's winter right now. Okay, cool. The sun will come. The sun will come. But what happens when the season doesn't change? Mm. You're just cold forever. Mm. And it's like, that's tough mm. because you're like, you expected it to end in, okay, cool. Summer comes in June. Summer's meant to come and now it's raining. You're disappointed. Mm. You only meet disappointment at the end. You know, um, whereas if you see it as like, this is just an avenue to like look at life and really enjoy it, then what you can do is you can find joy immediately like this. Yeah. And the problem isn't solved, but actually you can start to like, you can read it like a story, but it's your life. Mm. So what it allows you to do is it take, it takes a, you take a back seat in this car that's, that seems to be crashing and in some way you can put your arms up and enjoy the ride. Mm. That's mm. The, like, you know, um, I had this revelation while I was in Canada. I was thinking, I was, I was at the theme park and I, I, they brought me to a roller coaster and I thought <laughs> my body isn't allowed to move. I'm not, I shouldn't, I'm like six foot three, I'm like, 96 kg i'm not allowed to be thrown around like this this is not this doesn't feel legal at my size you know and but but while i was on there i i just had this rev revelation i was like this is life yeah and it's crazy we pay for that <laughs> yeah i mean right? i don't press i can't do roller coasters, <laughs> you can't do roller coasters. But, <laughs> but like we pay for that and I, I, i'm never paying for that again mm. but like people pay for that because because what we look for in a roller coaster is a thrill. Mm. Now, the problem with our lives is that we can't pay for an exit the same mm. way that we exit a ride and we can't pay for an entry. We don't mm. know. So the roller coaster gives us the thrill of what we can get from life, except it gives us the control of the end and the beginning. Yeah. It's that we, we can be assured that in three minutes it can end. Mm. Or in life, I have no surety of when it can end. Mm. But the reality is I only have 24 hours and I don't even know if I have that. Yeah. So really I have one minute. Yeah. So I live a minute at a time. You live a day at a time. You live a week at a time. Mm. And with that, what, what happens is you just get to enjoy the ride. And it's it's really tough. Like life gets really hard for me um, because a lot of what I do is decision-making. And it's not like, oh, let's let's talk about nice things. It's like somebody's <laughs> like, hey, like, bro, I don't like life right now. I mm. need to talk to someone. And you're having to walk people through 
kind of like dark forests of their mind and hope that they believe you. Mm. And sometimes that's somebody dealing with something like that whilst I mentor someone or look after somebody I look after. Mm. And sometimes that's like talking to a member of my team and being like, hey, we can't work together anymore. Mm. My life has just become decisions. And then, and as a leader, you don't get to protect yourself yep. ever. Um, but it's an adventure, man. And I think if we looked at Indeed. life more as an adventure, we can count it as joy right now, mm. even if it doesn't make sense. Mm. Um, it's the same way um, on the way here, uh, Unique asked me, oh, are you nervous? I was like, no. Yeah. And she was like, why? I was like, well, it's an adventure. I look forward to what I have to say. Mm. I think that's so incredible. Mm. Um, and mental health is a tough thing. It's, it's so real. Um, but we have to encourage people to move on yeah. and move through it um, and keep pushing uh, because there is no way you know if you can move than to move. Mm, mm. Um, so you crawl until you can walk. You walk until you can run. Indeed. And you Indeed. run until you can fly. Indeed. And, and that's that, that. I keep that in mind. And of course, I read the Bible. That gives me a lot of faith. But, mm. you know, like re really... That, that's the same message that we, we we crawl until we can walk. We walk until we're running. We run until we can fly. Word, word. Um, so that's, that's how I do Can it. we unpack something there? We are wrapping up in just a moment, but you were talking about supporting others in walking them through quite dark situations, circumstances. You said that those dark forests of their minds. Yeah. How do you protect yourself in that because in 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 carrying someone's burden or sharing yeah. that burden with and that's a very heavy sort of pastoral responsibility how do you navigate those those relationships yeah i mean you recognize that it that it's a blessing that it's not you it's number one um and it's not to say it in the sad way like oh i'm happy that it's not me yeah. but number one it's just not you i think sometimes as humans we over personalize matters to the point where Sometimes we need to cry with people, but sometimes we need to we need to stand with them and tell them, no, 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 like don't cry, stop mm, that. Mm. And it's not to shut their feelings off, but it's to help them navigate the feelings that they can't control. The same way that we help a dog who is super excited that comes to the dog and jumps on you. We teach them ways to manage their emotions, not to stop them from expressing, but to help them to place it mm. in the best way that's actually fruitful. Mm. Um, so for me, it's like, number one, it's just, it's just not happening to me. Mm. So like, if I can be next to them, and, and don't narcissistically or egotistically make it by myself. Yeah. It has nothing to do with me. Yeah. Which means I can share whatever, you, you know, I believe and I just won't take it personally, but I can take it seriously. Mm. And um, also, the, I have had a, different experiences. So I can guarantee that there is a way out of everything. Mm. I, think, I think it's possible. And if I don't, I can find somebody in my life. Who, and so, so through the community I have, I'm absolutely certain that we can get our way through anything. We can make our way through anything. And so... The quickest way with those moments is to try to get them to a community. Right. Act as a bridge. Right. And the moment we think we can solve people, we can be the only solution to people. The mm. moment we actually fall into the same abyss. Mm. Whereas actually, I'm just like, actually, hey, bro, I can listen to you. And when I see that it's too hard to conquer, I call a friend. Mm. And I call enough friends and we find that um, uh, fear, in, fear in the company of fears is a little less afraid. Mm. And so we just all be a little bit less afraid together. And hopefully Word. I lend you some of mine. And somebody lends me some of theirs. Yeah. Eventually, everything is conquerable um, for me. Really proverbial answers. I'm so sorry. Like it's, but I think that's how I think through life. I mean, I'm comprehending it, and I and I do receive that very well. I mean, I, I hope our listeners are, are yeah, comprehending so. this too. Uh -huh. um, you, you're giving quite a lot of depth to the discussion there. I, I guess springboarding off the word community I know you've already alluded to those around yourself and yeah. how you would support somebody and connect them to a community. What does your social support system look like and, and yeah. how did that come about? Were you intentional about choosing who gets to exist within that yeah. network or did it just happen uh, by chance that you came um, across them? I think a bit of both. Um, but, but I also think it's, it's because I'm open to relationships. I think relationships are very painful. And so the seduction is to every time you get hurt, shrink and don't rely on anybody again. Whereas I actively have to choose the opposite. Mm. Partially because, not partially, fully because I believe in my faith, by what I believe, that's the requirement. Mm. That's the prescription for a successful right. life is to actually lean in community. Yeah. It's not suggestion. Mm. So I don't treat it like one. Which means if my emotions are otherwise, I'm wrong. Mm. Um, 
so it's so it's a case of I'm always open to relationships because the reality is there is just so much. I, I can never see the back of my head. You've seen the back of my head. I think my hair looks nice. I probably isn't at the back. Mm. And only you can see that. Mm. Um, all I can see is a reflection. So I expose myself to people because it helps me see myself. And we're incredibly selfish as people. Mm. So yeah. um, you want to find enough mirrors. And I really care about having mirrors mm. um, because it helps me exist better. But yeah, I think for me, it's I meet a lot of people and I'm open to conversations. But of course, I'm quite intentional in relationships because I'm an intense person. But I think it's a balance of both. Um, open doors to people. And if uh, one of my beliefs is, and this is a gospel thing, I believe that you should make a strange, like a, take, take, find a stranger and make them a, a neighbor. A take them from a neighbor, make them a friend. Yeah. From a friend, make them a family. Mm. That's what I'm called to do. Um, so I take that seriously. Mm. Um, so that means that I'm, I move literally cities and I move my life based around my ability to live next to a stranger, mm. to see if we can journey to be, become a neighbor, mm. if we can journey to become a friend and family. Um, and in that, you just get adventures and, and, and you, you meet new people, you, you see cool things. So that's how I do it. And through that, in reflection, the accident becomes good relationships. Yeah. Um, so I, I can't tell you that there's any strategy, but to, to know who you are, because if you don't know who you are, you don't know what to say no to. Mm. So I know who I am, which means when I'm exposed to different things, I know what doesn't compromise me. Yeah. And I know what will compromise me. And so I can say no mm. before I say yes. So that's that's so there's, so there's definitely intention there. Absolute intention. Because um, um, the why is being established. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Now, last and final, before we wrap this up, um, sure. to the people, or to the young person particularly that's listening, and I'm thinking more so the student going through challenges that are, almost handicapping or presenting as an obstacle to their education, their success, or even that transition into employment, thinking about your journey and what you've shared so far, what would you advise a young person that might be experiencing fears, challenges, yeah, and is not too sure how to step forward? I know there's no context to that, but should a person approach you, how would you advise? Yeah. I mean, I'll tell them to approach me. Okay. So I can answer it longer than I would right now. Yeah. Um, but, um, number one, I think we have to change our, our thinking of how we see fear. Fear tells me that I care about something. Mm. That's it. If I care about my hand and it's burning and I feel like the heat, that, that shows I care about it. So fear shows me that I actually care about something. Mm. That's a really good thing. So, but, but you have to train your mind to approach the things you fear because the things you fear are actually things you really care about. Mm. So I'd say to a young person who is feeling scared about something, to, 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 that's okay. And you take that in, but don't change direction. Okay. Um, I just walk towards it. And I would say, just do everything that you can. Once again, my, my, my belief is increase the real estate of, of opportunity. Mm. Do everything you can, speak to everybody, share who you are. Because along the way, you find that I'm on this podcast because somehow you, you saw me somewhere. How would you have seen me there if I wasn't mm. there? Mm. Um, now you're building something. I'm part of your story in this moment. Mm. And who knows where this will go? Mm. And you're part of my story in this moment. Mm. You realize that the crux of every foundation, every business, every career, every structure is people just trying to build things mm. with very simple passions. Mm. And so if you don't, if you, if you can't build something, find a way to be with somebody that you care about their passion enough. Word. If you can build something, build the passion, mm. be everywhere. Because like a business is just a very long project. Mm. That's what it is. Mm. And the only difference between what you do right now, once, and what somebody's done doing as a business is consistency. Mm. So a business owner is just consistently afraid, but consistently challenging the fear. Wow. So if you can consistently challenge your fear, you might turn back and realize you built an empire, um, which I think is incredible. <laughs> wow. Um, so I would say be, be afraid, but be consistent in your approach against mm. the fear because you might find something that you could never uncover before mm. if you didn't feel that fear mm. and you know th th that's what i would say try everything do everything speak to everybody and once again for me if i want to if i want to raise a million pounds i have to speak to a million people about a pound yeah i have to so i have to i have to ask a million people for a pound whereas we're taught to in this quick world you know ask two people to give you five hundred thousand. yeah and that sounds great it's it's a very cheap like but i saw this on a podcast and i love it it's kind of cheesy but it's like <laughs> Um, I don't know if it's a podcast, but it says if you, you if you shortcut success, you will cut short your success. Mm. And I love that, in the sense that there is a part of it that is just going to be you fighting and wrestling with your fear, with your doubt, with the things that you care about. Mm. But don't step out the ring. Yeah. Just win the fight. Mm. And that's it. That's what I would say. It's proverbial, but think about it, and because it informs what you do. Mm. Um, mm. 
I don't do nothing more than light flames that are already in people's hearts. Mm. And so that's the best work. Beautiful. It's the best work. Thank you so much. And where can people find you if they want to engage with you and your body of yes. work? Yes. Yeah, so um, you can uh, find me on LinkedIn, Josiah Hysynth. You just search Josiah Hysynth. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere, Instagram, Twitter, it's all the same, YouTube. And go on an adventure because it's going to be hard to find out what I do. <laughs> um, I mean, I tried. I tried. I, was, I wanted yeah. to pin it down to one word, one sentence. I was like, this guy is everywhere. Yeah, it's it um, it good. Digital nomad. Probably, digital, right? digital nomad. Yeah. No, that's beautiful. Thank you so much, Josiah. Um, and I really do feel encouraged. I know that others are going to be encouraged by the hearing of this. Uh, thank you for just being so honest, open and transparent with us. Really appreciate, appreciate it. Appreciate you. Thank you.